Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Samari. I am a product manager at Facebook for our camera AR team. Uh, we have about 60 minutes worth of content I'm gonna try to get through in 15, so I'm gonna be moving fast and talking quickly. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to just grab me at the end outside. Uh, when I first started working on AR, it was about four and a half years ago, and the way it was introduced to me is I had to go through a room that I had to badge in three times, I had to have a fingerprint scan, and only then in this basement conference room where the leadership at my company competent enough to share this idea about this ubiquitous AR head-worn future. It's been amazing in the past four and a half years to see that this idea that at one time felt like this secret that we were working towards has become, again, ubiquitous throughout the industry and is something we're all collectively working on with 6,000 people here this week. The other large change that's happened in this four and a half years is how we think about approaching that future. When I started, the idea was VR was gonna be the main waypoint and it was gonna be the key computing modality that would drive towards this AR always on future. What we've seen, and again, the industry has really replicated over the past year, is that this strategy doesn't really work. And the reason it doesn't work is that although VR is an incredibly compelling product, if your goal is to have a data layer in the world filled with apps and content and experiences, you're limited into how you're actually gonna be able to place those if you're only looking through the VR modality. So what we did last year in 2017 is we went for a bifurcated approach that again, we saw become an industry standard quickly thereafter. On one end, you have the continued investment in VR, and for us, this is at Oculus. This is incredibly necessary for the sake that hardware and this technology is gonna take a lot of time to develop, things like optics, display engines, AI that runs in silicon. But on the other side, and this is the area of the business that I'm keenly focused on, is mobile AR. And this is where we can really start creating this meaning for people today. So when you look at your phone less as this 2D scrollable interface, but more as a magnifying glass that's letting you see into this AR content all around you, what you realize is that this head-worn, always-on future is actually much closer than it seems. And a lot of these meaningful interactions, meaningful experiences, meaningful utility that we think about the future is actually achievable today with the AR device that we all have already sitting in our pocket. So again, this uh, was announced at Facebook last year at F8. Our focus for the past 12 months has really been around unlocking creativity, and we did this in a variety of ways. The main way is we created this tool. It was called AR Studio. It allowed creators to go and write some JavaScript, add some visual effects that people could add to photos or videos within Facebook and share with their friends. You could do things like face masks. You could do things like AR world stickers that you could actually place in the environment around you. And what we created was a single solution uh, that worked cross-platform. So this is build once, uh, ship on both iOS and Android. We delivered these effects uh, through the Facebook camera app. And the truly unbelievable thing is as of today, there are 1.5 billion people on this planet with a phone in their pocket with the Facebook app that has these AR experiences on them. So again, if we're focused on driving this always on head-worn future and using mobile AR as our vehicle to get there, having massive distribution uh, with the AR device people already have is really, is really where we're focused. So for the next 12 months, we want to give you a peek in terms of how we're thinking about the industry um, and how we're going to approach it with Facebook. And there's really three pillars I'm going to talk about. The first is ease of creation. Um, I love software developers. I have many software developers on my team. But if you're relying exclusively on software developers to create the experiences of the future, you're going to miss out a variety of diverse content and diverse types of experiences from people that just simply don't know how to code. So for us, making it incredibly easy for people to create AR experiences Experiences and place them around the world is going to be a huge focus. The second is around capabilities. And the way I like to describe this is we want to go from just placing things in your world to making them feel like they actually belong in your world. Again, you're doing this in AR because it actually is interacting with your real reality. So the more contextually rich experiences we can create, the higher that illusion is going to be. And then finally, distribution. Uh, we've talked about the 1.5 billion number, which is exciting, but thinking about how you intercept people that have various types of intent, various types of actions they're trying to accomplish, and creating distribution channels that are meaningful is our third key area. So let's quickly talk about ease of creation. So as I mentioned before, it turns out that not everybody knows how to code in JavaScript. So one of the things we've been focused on is this idea of visual programming, and we call this tool our patch editor. What the patch editor allows you to do is actually take 
any of the complex things you would need to do in code and do it completely visually without having to write a semi -sem semicolon at the end of a sentence. So this includes things like not needing to know how to write JavaScript. You can do interactions, all of the audio work, DSP processing, even material creation and texturing, um, all within uh, these visual programming tools. The second, and again, many people in this room are probably very familiar with this, is importing 3D assets can be incredibly unpredictable. So one of the things we're doing is making this dead simple with a drag and drop interface that works with a variety of file formats. So when you take any 3D asset and bring it into AR Studio, we're gonna bring along the animations, we're gonna bring along the texture, we're gonna bring along the mesh, make sure this works with a variety of file formats, make sure that these animations are reusable and that all these components are really clean. The final is, again, if you've ever tried to make a 3D model from scratch, it's a pretty complicated process. It's typically reserved for the professional or maybe even the prosumer, but it's not something that everybody can do. So one of the things we're really excited about is we've integrated asset libraries directly in with AR Studio, so creators can go, um, this example you're seeing right here is with Sketchfab, go grab a 3D model, bring it in with all of its associated metadata, textures, animations, and actually use it in an AR experience that you can ship within Facebook. So again, you don't need to model these things yourself, as well as making them incredibly easy to import. So capabilities. The word you're gonna hear me talk a lot about right now is context aware and context relevance. This is really the key of what we're thinking about for the next 12 months on how to make these experiences more meaningful. So there's two components to this. The first is arguably the most important thing in the world, and I hope there's no disagreement on this, which is people. So how are we thinking about augmenting people and yourself in new ways? Uh, the first is through something we're calling the high fidelity face tracker. So your face is the most expressive part about you, the most meaningful part of your personality. Um, we've had incredible success with a lot of our face tracking effects, and we want to make this even more powerful. Um, so what we're doing is where we've created a new face model that we're calling the high fidelity face tracker. It's got 30% uh, more feature points on it that makes the tracking really incredible. Um, it's got very high precision around the mouth and the eyes across skin tones, um, which allows you to do things like photorealistic makeup and a lot of photorealistic effects that create the illusion very richly. Uh, the second is hand tracking. So hands are a key manipulation tool. We've all talked about it for a long time. What you're seeing here is an example of an AR experience we partnered with Disney on when they launched the Avengers. They had a variety of AR experiences you could do with hand tracking, including this Scarlet Witch effect. Um, what we're doing with hand tracking is we're starting simple and going broad. So we have a hand tracking detection and bounding box that we can track, and it's actually very robust regardless of hand pose. So you don't have to have a very fixed hand shape, but regardless of how your hand is uh, formed, we're able to track it within the scene. Uh, the next is body tracking. Um, so what we're seeing here, it's very bizarre to me why he's doing the chicken dance when he has no chickens around him, but that's besides the point. Um, what we're doing is tracking 2D joints in the body and allowing you to apply AR experiences on top of it. Um, so again, this just allows uh, you to highlight the most meaningful thing in the capture, which is the people with really rich experiences, and we support the full body. And then the final one, and this is one a lot of us have been working on in the industry for a long time, is background segmentation. So you can see whether you're creating an experience just for fun, like putting the rock star show behind you. As an aside, I absolutely love this use case. We found incredible adoption with Facebook Live with AR. People love using AR as a form of storytelling and helping convey the message they want. Um, so we opening up background segmentation. One of the really interesting things about background segmentation is if any of you have used Instagram's focus mode that is actually in their camera, uh, this was actually built entirely in AR Studio on top of our background segmentation stack. So it goes to show that these AR experiences don't necessarily have to be sort of the transport, transformative, transporting ones we've talked about, but can be something really, really subtle that creates meaning for people. If people is the first part, the second part is obviously your world and how you augment your world in new ways. There's a couple things we're gonna talk about here. The first is AR target tracking. You've probably seen a little bit of this from us in the press. We talked about this at F8, but again, this is being able to recognize a 2D image, logo, poster, whatever it may be, and then automatically track an AR experience on top of it. It's a huge unlock to being able to go create and instantiate a bunch of persistent AR experiences out in the world. Um, it's really powerful because we all have such recognition with a lot of these types of imagery, and it's something we're excited you can use today in AR Studio. 
The next one, and again, this video is slightly goofy, but I think the meaning of this one is really powerful, which is semantic scene understanding. So you can see her pet hippo when she's in the kitchen has the apron on versus when she turns around to the living room and sitting eating popcorn on the couch. A lot of times when we think about AR and making it richer in your world, we think about it in the pure physics sense. We talk about things like occlusion and lighting. Uh, scene understanding is really powerful because it allows that emotional resonance. It's subtle, but it makes these experiences really really feel like they belong. Uh, so we have 40 known concepts that we're doing scene understanding with. Uh, these experiences can immediately respond to the environment and yeah. The next one is Location AR. Um, we heard about it in the keynote this morning. It sounds like it's going to be a key theme of the conference this week. But being able to place AR experiences in the world that people can go find over time. Uh, so what we're doing with Location AR is we have integration with our places graph. Any creator can go, and when they create an effect, actually go place it in a physical location in the world associated with the places graph, uh, where people will be able to find it on the Facebook family of apps. And then finally, um, again, when we're thinking about inviting people into this new computing paradigm, uh, you may have seen 3D posts in Newsfeed before. What we're able to do now is actually directly open any 3D post into camera and view it in the real world. So again, um, we all know AR. There's 6,000 people here that know AR. But for the majority of folks uh, out in the world, AR is still a new concept. So this is a great way of getting our experiences out in front of them. This should work with any 3D content on Facebook. Um, and again, something you can try today. To wrap it up, let's talk a little bit about distribution. And again, the idea here is uh, intercepting people when they have intent that we can serve with AR in really rich ways. The first place we're actually going to go um, that I'm very excited about is Facebook Lite. So if you're not familiar, Facebook Lite is a version of the Facebook app that has been optimized for low bandwidth environments um, for people in the world that don't have access to 4G. Um, and so we've actually done a lot of work to be able to bring AR experiences to that app. So this will open up a lot more environments for us and a lot more individuals that will be able to use these experiences. The second is in Messenger. So you may have seen this, but we did integration directly with Messenger bots. So as you're interacting with a brand or a business, say you want to try something on or see something visualized in your space, the bot in that conversation can actually encourage you to open your camera and see it. Uh, we did this actually at F8 with uh, the new Kyrie sneakers with Nike. We sold out uh, within an hour from people directly doing commerce with the bot. So um, this is a use case we're very, very excited about and excited to dig deeper. And then finally, uh, Instagram. So Instagram uh, truly is the app for uh, visual sharing today in the world. So we're doing a closed beta with them right now. We actually have uh, one of our, our first AR experiences coming out this week uh, that you will all be able to try. Um, and then we're hoping to open up the platform within Instagram throughout the rest of the year so we can bring in more and more AR experiences and again, intercept different types of users in, a, in an intent that makes sense. So where I'm gonna close out is I'm actually gonna show you a video um, that we have internally of how we think about the next year of mobile AR and where our focus area is at Facebook. I'm not gonna make you do a fingerprint scan like I had to do four and a half years ago or any secrecy. Uh, we're doing it in the wide open. I'm incredibly excited about where we're going and this is uh, how we think about it. And we have music if you can hit the volume.
Awesome. So we have, it looks like, four minutes, and I know there was going to be some Q&A. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, the question was actually referencing uh, the video and the idea of like placing content in space. What happens when we do this at scale with a bunch of people? Um, we're going to be making a series of um, announcements and product announcements about this over the next year. But obviously, the privacy model is going to be incredibly important to us, as well as the security model, audience control. Um, fortunately, these are all things we've done at Facebook for a very uh, long time. So we're familiar with the systems and how to do it. Um, but look for more information to come on that. Hello, how you doing? Uh, my name is Lex, I'm a VR developer uh, and XR developer. Um, can you tell me about uh, what it looks like from a developer's perspective? Uh, what is kind of the, um, uh, the life cycle of a developer uh, in this space uh, in terms of maybe finding clients, uh, brands that, that want to create um, uh, content here? And uh, what, what is your view on that? How do you, how do you see developers in this, uh, in this world? Sure, I think developers are incredibly important. I think what you're seeing um, uh, with, when we talk about like ease of creation is finding an even more expansive view so we can get people beyond just the regular software developers. Uh, so for anyone today, you can go download AR Studio and begin making these experiences. Um, we have had a ton of success with brands and a lot of independent developers that have been working with agencies or different groups to get access um, for more of that more traditional um, brand engagement with AR. Um, but yeah, you, anyone can download the tool and start playing with it today. Yeah. Any other questions? There you go. I'm going to get this guy back there first, and then I'll come right back to you. What will be involved with uh, being part of the Instagram beta? Is that completely closed off, or is there ways for creators to apply to be part of that? Or so we have we have selected the first 50 partners for that. Um, as information becomes available on us opening it up and the the success of that beta, I would just connect with our partnerships team, and they uh, they will be handling the process from there. And then right up here in front. Right, great great presentation, thank you. Um, quick question on on work that the work app. Are there any plans for integrating AR technology into that? Um, so the question was on our workplace app. Um, we are always having conversations with all of the, the Facebook family of apps. I think for that one specifically, we'd really want to figure out where's the key value that we can provide people that's meaningful um, and understanding how that would work with our platform. So it's a, as with any of the Facebook apps, it's something that we are uh, thinking about, but no definitive plans at the moment. All right, one more. Obviously, the distribution model for AR Studio is on the Facebook platform, but there are other um, studio authoring tools that uh, have a broadened distribution. Is there any plans for opening it up so that those formats can be used in other environments? Right now, we're very focused on the, the Facebook family of apps, and I think uh, Paradoxically, um, keeping it within the Facebook family of apps is actually giving us the highest amount of distribution. Uh, and I'm not necessarily sure there's a distribution advantage to going elsewhere at the moment. Um, but uh, we're always interested in exploring new use cases and how do, we, how do we challenge the perception of what you can do on Facebook as well as what you can do with AR. And so we're just working towards all opportunities to make that happen.